this is just the um, cover. Yeah, please, thanks. Of I had trouble in getting to Sala Salu. Um, and it is, you know, it's in one way, it, it seems, and I think because so many of the stories of Dr. Seuss are these, you know, humanoid or catoid uh, critters on adventures, right? That it seems like this just you know, warm and fantabulous uh, story making. Hey, Zach, can I have my screen back? Thank you. Um, storytelling. Um, but really, I had trouble in getting to Sala Salu, which is longer than Zach, so I'm not going to read it all, um, is, as I see it, anti-utopian. It's this, it's this kid, really, um, this humanoid character, uh, who imagines that if that he you know sees the troubles he's having where he is, and some character comes up out of nowhere and says, "I'm going to the place where there is no problems. Come with me," and they run into problem after problem after problem upon getting to get there, and he finally arrives at the gate, and there's a thing in the lock, and so you can't get in. Uh, but the gatekeeper says, "Ah, but I'm going down the road to the next place that's perfect. Why don't you come with me, kid?" And the kid says you know what? No, I'm actually going to arm myself with the skills and the tools that I need to defend myself against the stuff back in my home. And I'm going to go home. I'm going to live where home is. And I'm going to be strong. And I'm going to become, and you know, obviously I'm using the modern language, but I'm going to, I'm going to become anti-fragile. And I'm going to see what I can see about where I am and find the values in it and become stronger in it as opposed to constantly chasing a fantasy that does not exist. I wonder, so you're right, that sounds perfectly anti-utopian. And the question I have is, so I didn't know this book. Yeah, um, and I haven't, I, I still haven't shared it with you, sorry. But I wonder if, um, I wonder whether or not you would find that people who had a childhood relationship with that book had an immunity to utopian thinking at some level. I would not be surprised if yeah. a, uh, you know, if this, I mean, in, in some sense, um, I'm wondering a little bit, thinking about you know what we've barely touched on here, which is that actually, in some ways, the poetry is the easiest part, right? Yeah. The really difficult part is the illustrations, which are amazingly evocative. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, it's psychedelic experience for people who can't have psychedelic experience because they're children, right? And so the mm -hmm. point is this, the, the world that is presented in these books is a place that you would very much want to go and see and spend the afternoon and then look around and engage with strange creatures. And Just while you're talking, Zach, can you just show my screen? I'll just scroll through some of these images from Solid We're not going to read it, but just yeah. as you're talking about like being able to, you know, it's children who are in some ways living psychedelic experience on every, right. it, every day. Well, they, and they, then you know, they mature out of it and then maybe they can choose to engage in it explicitly and intentionally. But um, that that is part of what Seuss allows you an inroad into. Right. But, you know, the thing is... Psych psychedelic experience is for both better and worse about um mind hacking and so the point is that in in the wrong hands that can be a disaster mm -hmm. in the right hands if somebody who knows that utopianism is an attractive idea that results in atrocities mm -hmm. and they try to teach you this lesson in a fanciful harmless way in effect this is the evidence of the opposite that this is the safe way to discover the danger. It's not that the language is violence. It's that the language is the antidote to violence. It is the way that you can discover that something violent lurks in your uh, desire to perfect the world. And in this case, yes. the fact that you can't get to utopia isn't the end game <laughs> if you try. Right. But um, but nonetheless, you know, every time I I see these illustrations, there is some childlike part of me that wants to see that contraption. Definitely wants to look at trees that look like those trees, whatever they are. You right. Know. Wants to see the trees, wants to um, figure out if the physics of that crazy thing actually works. Right, exactly. <laughs> right? And, and you know, every time we do see really <laughs> weird trees in the world, uh -huh. right, baobabs or whatever, right. you and I always comment on the Seussian nature the first of time we saw things. baobabs in Western Madagascar, both of us are like, this is a Seussian landscape, 100%. Seussian. And then, oh my God, south and southern Madagascar with the Didriaceae, those crazy tall, like everything yeah. in Madagascar practically. Is it is. It is. And a I mean, that's device. that's part of also. So I think you can give me my computer back now, Zach. But that's that's part of how you know the basis I think for the cancellation too. And I, like again, I, I want to talk about what's amazing about him first here. But sure. um, 
Like the fact is that he was, I believe, an American and a white guy with um, the, you know, somewhat, but really not very, but somewhat provincial worldview of a guy who was rooted in his particular space and time. Yeah. And to the degree that he had been elsewhere um, and he saw the amazingness of what was not his home, what was elsewhere for him. He reflected on it with admiration and joy and love and amazingness. And yes, there was some there was there was some racist stuff in the early early stuff of totally. his, but um, but his reflections of people who haven't had my experience, my Seuss's experience, um, actually live these amazing other lives is exactly what we should all be hoping for. It is what the value of travel is. It is what the value of reading stories from other cultures are um, and talking to people from other places and engaging with everyone as if they have something valuable to offer. And God damn it, it's perfectly <clears throat> democratizable. Yes. Right? So yes. in in a sense, um, unfortunately, and you know, as, as, uh, as a liberal, and I'm sure as a fellow liberal, you will resonate with this, one of the great shames of the West is that our schools are radically unequal, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got money, you get better schools, and that matters, right? You can't easily democratize that. It should be democratized. We should ensure it, but you can't easily do it. On the other hand, Seuss books are very inexpensive, mm -hmm. and the point is anybody who speaks the language is in a position to benefit from them equally. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I really do feel as an adult that – some fraction of the schooling that actually worked for me came from Seuss without ever <laughs> stepping in a classroom. Yeah. And, you know, given that it's, I mean, the great thing, and this actually goes to Mark Rober's point about um, uh, the Mario Brothers effect, he calls it, that the motivational stuff on the screen that causes you to learn the pattern of hitting buttons uh, is a model for education. You and I have said that education shouldn't uh, be painful. It should feel like games and experiences and things that you want to do so you don't even know you're in school. Well, this is like that. It feels so much like fun mm -hmm. that it is now failing to have the proper defense because it seems frivolous when it is anything but. Yeah. It is highly constructive. Yeah, no, the, the, the concern now is being dismissed as if it's A, you know, more right-wing nuts who are yeah. complaining and why the hell do you care? Right. It's children's books at the same time that all the modern children's books that I can find that, you know, yeah. actually I didn't go looking at children's books, but a few years ago, as I've said on this live stream before, I went looking for young adults, book, young adult books, YA books um, at Powell's at the extraordinary massive independent bookstore in downtown Portland. Um, and I was appalled at um at the choices available and really could only find books that were, are now considered classics um like you know like Essie Hinton um the outsider the outsiders is that yeah yeah yes um and um and such that weren't just so broken by wokeness um that uh they didn't you know, they read like a slog. You know, they, the art, of course, is compromised when the ideology is first and foremost. You know, there, there's a reason reason that Soviet propaganda, for instance, didn't pass for lasting art, right? Like, the, it, propaganda is propaganda, and most good people, most, like, without ever thinking about why or being conscious of it, be like, okay, if ideology came first here, um, this isn't, this, this isn't fun, and it isn't, probably right either or at least it causes people almost everyone to sort of go mm, wait what what is that like what actually are they trying to do to my head here well it's uh it's an analog really to the comparison that we used to make in the teaching environment that the proper role of a professor is to teach you how to think not what to think right um, we used to say that a lot and in this case i feel like the thing about seuss is that he very much taught you how to think yeah. and the details yeah. of what is in the books are irrelevant for one thing they're so fanciful mm -hmm. that they don't map directly it's the general lessons and the ability to play with language and all of those things and so you know the comparison between some finger wagging ya book that tells you exactly what to think about some complex topic and pretends it's simple versus uh you know Seuss who takes uh shows you just how complex simple simple things can be made if you yep. juggle them properly. Um, it's, yes. Uh, it's, a, it's a power tool. Yeah. You know? oh, it, it, it is. It's a power tool.